I think it has started and it is recording. Okay, that's good. Okay, and I don't know how we'll know how many when attendees are here. Will you see that? You can see if you click on participants, um, the sidebar opens up and we got about 26 and increasing rapidly. Okay, okay, well, that's great. <laughs> so if people are seeing us and we're live and welcome everyone as you're rolling in. Um, we'll give it a couple minutes to get going here and get everybody into the room. It was a beautiful day in Toronto. It was one of those days. It was the first day I put on shorts. Um, so that was uh, very exciting and a good, um, a good feeling for the first time to be out in the sun. I think people are feeling really good about that. Um, for those who are just arriving, uh, my name is Allison Kriba. And um, I, have a, I have a small practice that's based in Toronto, uh, Ontario, in Canada. Uh, it's called Local Technique, and it operates at the intersection of architectural conservation and waste. And it explores the possible futures and entangled pasts of sites, structures, and materials. And I do this in multiple ways. Um, including instances like this, uh, where I uh, submit proposals to organizations like ACO Toronto, um, who accept them and allow me to sort of take free reign on organizing a panel uh, series um, to my heart's content. Um, so this is a, a very exciting uh, event for me. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew Sambri uh, for a moment to say hello and uh, say a quick word about ACO TO. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen as we discussed. Hang on. Wait before I do that. Okay, over to you, Matthew. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Matthew Zambri, president of the Toronto branch of the Architecture Conservancy of Ontario. Um, if you're a member, it's great that you joined us. If you're not a member, I encourage you to check us out. Um, we advocate through, for heritage through public education and um, through events like this, much like Allison just said. Um, this is our symposium for 2021. Usually this symposium is done in person, but Everything these days is digital. Um, I just hope that everyone enjoys it. Um, I would like to thank Allison and our esteemed guests for attending tonight to talk to us about this very interesting topic. Um, and I'll let Allison roll right into it. I hope everyone has a great time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I think um, to start this event, um, we're gonna start with a, a simple thought experiment that everybody can do from home. And uh, the first mental place that you're gonna go to is to think about the structure that you are currently in. And then think about the structure which stood in its place before it. And think about the people that inhabited that structure. Now think if you can about the building that stood there before that. And go back if you can, as far back, visualizing a sequence of structures until you arrive at the land. Now think about the people who inhabited that land and the animals. Here in Toronto, this land was inhabited and cared for by many peoples and nations for whom we are very grateful. Um, they are uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, 
the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And it remains home to uh, a, a wide range of diverse First Nations and including Inuit and Métis people. And uh, it would be remiss to start a, uh, a panel discussion on uh, heritage and um, in some ways material and, and cultural displacement um, without uh, thinking about uh, that, that heritage um, here. And so with that, um, um, thank you to the original stewards of this land and, um, and on behalf of the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario Toronto branch, we'll get started. I have a little introduction as well. Um, so in his article, uh, Slow Down City, published in the Journal of Architecture at the start of this year, Dan wrote, Dan Hill wrote, uh, the year 2020 may be the first time under skies free of air traffic and briefly green and pleasant streets hosting radically altered patterns of living, working and shopping that we could collectively ask questions about the accumulations that have been happening for decades. Indeed, the unique conditions of the global pandemic have afforded us an unprecedented perspective to view and review the seemingly unstoppable forces that have shaped our world. So today's discussion on demolition is the first of three talks. It is also a product of the pandemic. As Matthew said, um, this online series fills the void of what would have been the ACO Toronto's uh, annual symposium, which is usually a one day in in-person affair um, in this webinar format, we are able to welcome attendees and panelists from multiple provinces and countries, and um, that is a great uh, attribute, and I'm very glad that everyone could join us. So the series themes, uh, demolition, deconstruction, and displacement, represent a form of critical reflection for not only the heritage discourse, but a broader uh, but broader conversations in architecture, urbanism, and landscape studies. Through these conversations, we are exploring not only the physical accumulations of buildings, and in this case, rubble, but also the broader cultural imprint of these processes. So the destruction of buildings is in some ways always a relevant topic around the world and indeed right likely right around the corner from where you are today, uh, buildings are being demolished as assertions of political and economic power. In the heritage community, demolition represents both material and cultural loss and has been a key catalyzing force against which it rallies. In the same vein, demolition has defined the modern movement in architecture and urbanism. And in urban development, demolition is a process which increases property value by tearing down structures to replace them with larger ones. Though so apparently pivotal in shaping the built environment, remarkably little attention is paid to the logistics, history, and impact of these processes. But recent calls to action have reinvigorated the importance of looking more deeply at the environmental and cultural effects of these processes. And to do that, we have to dive in. And so that's what we're here to do together tonight. Um, I'm joined by three wonderful panelists and one wonderful assistant. Um, and uh, together, we're hoping to, uh, to get into it over the next um, hour and a little bit. So. Before I launch into things, there's just a quick uh, housekeeping. Um, you are all, uh, the audience is, 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 um, is reaching us on a, on a webinar platform. That means you can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, you are welcome to submit questions and comments, um, ideas in the chat. Um, Juliet uh, will be moderating the chat uh, for us and before that, before we get into audience comments, um, we'll have presentations by each of our presenters. And then in between, we'll have a, have a small uh, discussion amongst the, the, the four of us um, before opening it up. So that's the basic format. Um, 
I'm going to uh, introduce the speakers uh, in order of how they will present. Um, I think speakers, we can all turn off. Oh no, we can keep our we'll keep our uh, cameras on. Um, fewer logistics, um, and and uh, speakers can uh, we'll we'll go in that order. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, um, I'm I'm very honored to uh, welcome, firstly, Jordan Tepperman to this panel. Um, I had the uh, privilege of uh, interviewing Mr. Tepperman uh, for a recent paper on the history of demolition in Toronto. He is the fifth generation in the lineage of the Tepperman demo of Tepperman Demolition, one of Toronto's oldest demolition companies. Um, Jordan embodies local history of this practice and a unique perspective on the evolution of the city. Um, he is also the executive vice president, or sorry, yeah, vice president of Haven Developments. So following him is uh, Jeff Biles, whose book, uh, Rubble, Unearthing the History of Demolition was uh, very influential for me. Um, it was a key research, uh, reference for my own research. Um, and um, has appeared in numerous papers and, and bibliographies and libraries um, as I've continued uh, looking into the topic. Uh, he's a certified plan planner, planner, urban planner, uh, based in New York City, uh, where he works at the intersection of site and society to create places and communities that foster well-being. And last but not least, um, I is Francesca Rusella Amon. Uh, I was first introduced to her through her compelling book, Bulldozer, Demol The Demolition and Clearance of Post-War America. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting uh, in 2018 in Pittsburgh um, and uh, got to learn a little bit more about her and her research. Um, she is an urban urban and planning historian of the built environment, an associate pro, uh, professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and author of the great book that I um, just mentioned. So um, without further ado, I will pass it over. Um, Jordan, if you want to take it away. Thank you, Allison. Um, <clears throat> You know, cities evolve and they become um, um, what they become by a mixture of heritage and demolition. So, you know, people uh, don't real, realize that um, renewal um, is the key to, to many of the, um, many of the, uh, the, the, the strength and evolution of cities. Um, you know, with old comes new and with new comes new vision and families. And so people, you know, when they see something necessarily being dismantled, um, there's some, some side of the coin that says, well, you know, here, here they are destroying history. But on the other hand, you know, they're, they're, the argument could be made that, that, that new life is being brought into this, this urban core. So you know, those are those are thoughts and considerations that that certainly, um, you know, I relate to um, playing, you know, been fortunate enough to play both sides of the fence where, you know, one, we were we were hired across North America, not just in Toronto, but, you know, I remember the story of a battery park in New York City in Olympia, New York, which was a major Canadian developer that went on to build Canary Wharf and and um, and uh, major projects in Toronto and 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 definitely in the United States. I mean, they were one of the largest developers between, I'd say, in the late '60s to early '80s, and they got uh, unfortunately uh, crushed uh, when Margaret Thatcher canceled the subway out to Canary Wharf, which was their signature international project. Um, but they did Battery Park and where Battery Park was, and if you look at old pictures of, of New York City, um, Battery Park was, was not a very enlightened um, area of New York City. And then eventually, you know, uh, industry and living and, um, 
and 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 culture came into being and it was all on the, the start of the demolition of the former uh uh properties that 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 once created life to the creation of that part of the city same can be said about many centers in toronto sorry many centers across canada and the evolution of roadways railway sea ways and as well as cities because of demolition. Jordan, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the sort of the history and the story of, of Tepperman? How did, how and where did it begin? Tepperman um, was started in the year of 1918. Um, the, like many, many companies just from a entrepreneurial corporate don't last into five generations. Um, you know, Johnson and Johnson, a family business, uh, they, they didn't make it into multi-generations. Um, you know, Canada had the famed Eaton family, that, that apartment store glory, and they didn't make it into five generations. And, you know, there's many, every business is a life. And, um, in the, you know, I remember someone telling me that the demolition business would have a an evolution, like a, a full like recharge every 20, 30 years, because that's how cities, the duration of city evolution. And so Tepperman was started in 1918 in Toronto uh, by a Polish immigrant, uh, who was my great, great uh, grandfather, uh, who had immigrated to Canada. And he was a baker by trade. Um, and he, uh, he was asked by his two sons uh, to come into business with them. Uh, it was my uncle Joe and my great great grandfather who were in business, and then they had convinced my great grandfather to go into the business as well. And um, they they were in the business, and they uh, for their time, um, my understanding was. Uh, from some of the research, historical research that I've been able to do is that uh, they made their, their money off salvage, uh, which was uh, back then they would rip apart a house. They would pay the, ven the, 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 the person that asked them to take the, the structure apart and, um, and, 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 they, and they had a yard. Uh, as 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 the as the business evolved between uh, my great grandfather and and my great uncle, um, you know the jobs got bigger, and uh, with the bigger the the larger the projects, uh, they um, you know they they, they the business uh, grew. Uh, their children came into the business, being our grandfather and his first cousin. And that's where the business really took off. And at that time, um, there were centers across Canada and they were also in the United States. And so uh, it wasn't just uh, an operate, a local operation. It became more of a, of a, of a multi-corporation that they, they had uh, become a very large entity and were responsible for a number of significant projects, not only across Canada, but the United States as well, that they had been uh, involved with, um, and, um, you know, in, in, in its modern day, uh, you know, it's been run and diversified into, into other entities. So, so it's, it's evolved, it's evolved and has had many, uh, it, the company has probably had one, two, three, four, five, I would say it's had about maybe eight or nine presidents. So it's, it's evolved, uh, into, into, um, from a horse and buggy, operation to, uh, very labor intensive to a multifaceted equipment uh, based uh, operation and you know I noticed one of your um, one of your themes about wrecking and demolition and you know if you ask the average person about wrecking and demolition someone would say well they were the same thing they're actually not the same thing because demolition is a process whereas you know wrecking is a um, uh, it was of the of yesterday where they would you know wreck a building and salvage it so you'd see a lot of the old time businesses that would say wrecking under their signature line like temperament wrecking 
but uh, but I, but in the modern day, um, you will see a lot of the modern outfits, the the later sort of companies that would have spun off from us, or 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 became part of the uh, fabric in the country. Um, and there are some uh, they 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 refer to demolition because of the the modern uh, modern technology behind the uh, between the uh, behind the strategy. Thank you so much for that um, for that excla explanation. Uh, I think that's a really good foundation for uh, laying the groundwork for uh, Jeff and Francesca to follow up. Um, I think that the concept of, of wrecking versus demolition is one that I hope to we can elaborate on because it also hints at other concepts um, like salvage and waste um, of materials um, and also relationships to uh, labor and mechanization, um, which are a part of sort of the, the technical and, and uh, cultural evolution of, of the trade. So thanks so much for that early history. We, um, we can loop back um, to it. Um, maybe move on to, to Jeff, if you want to take over from here. Great, thank you, Allison, and uh, thank you, Jordan, for, for that, those comments. Um, it's really an honor to be here um, and, and be a part of this program, so I'm really thrilled. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, I wanted to say a few words first about how I came to the subject of demolition um, about 20 years ago now. Um, at the time, I was a writer focused on cities and urban landscapes, and especially post-industrial places. And in, in tracing the unraveling of cities, I was fascinated by the idea that, that demolition, which was often seen as a callous agent of urban erasure, could also be considered a kind of generative or, or creative process. And the more I explored this idea of creative destruction, the more I wanted to try to understand the power of demolition, both in the physical forces it unleashes, but also the impacts it makes architecturally, culturally, even existentially. And so that was the premise of my book, Rubble. And as I continued to explore the evolution of cities, I was eventually drawn to landscape architecture and community planning as a means to somehow harness these forces for the common good. Today, in that spirit, I work with my wife in a small landscape architecture and consulting practice, which seeks to sustain and renew urban places. One of the things I found so compelling about demolition was the way in which its story reflects broader urban, economic, and technological transitions, tearing down train halls, like New York's old Pennsylvania station seen here, or the Hudson's department store in Detroit, or a whole neighborhood in Newark, crystallized debates about society's values, about the idea of progress, what it means for architecture and what it means for us. I wanna briefly trace the evolution of demolition both as a trade and a civic phenomenon starting with an early and influential large-scale demolition effort. <clears throat> the reconstruction of Paris under Baron Haussmann beginning in the 1850s. I consider this the genesis of demolition as a cultural force. In his role as chief architect of the city, Haussmann personified the coming use of demolition as a means to solve myriad social and environmental ills. Here are the city's winding lanes and their endemic crime and depravity were transformed in the name of public health into a more harmonious urban environment with ample light and air, at the same time uprooting the rebellious working class precincts. Haussmann called himself artist demolitionist and his work surgical operations that pierced wide new boulevards through the tangled quarters. With simple tools of the trade, picks, trowels, wagons, tens of thousands of houses made way for 400 miles of new pavements, sewers, street trees, and other amenities. Some 14,000 demolitionists worked day and night under electric light with horses and carriages carting off the debris. 
you can barely see the wreckers arrayed along the rooftops as building facades are daringly pulled down with wire rope. Or here in this striking photograph by Charles Marvy, who documented the demolition. Many lamented the destruction caused by Hausmann's urban embellishments, but poets and artists of the day found the demolition scenes almost enchanting. This destruction is not without beauty, one confessed. The play of light and shade across the ruins over the random blocks of fallen stone and wood makes for picturesque effects. As a critic later pointed out, the works of Hausmann spoke to broader forces largely beyond his control. He was caught within what was called a storm he neither created nor tamed, but a deep turbulence in the evolution of French economy, politics, and culture. Indeed, in the decades that followed, the restless rebuilding of cities reflected what economists called creative destruction, a process whereby economic structures are constantly revolutionized, old ones destroyed and new ones created. Nowhere was this process better depicted than in lower Manhattan at the heart of American capitalism. This is Jacob Volk, once called the greatest wrecker of all time. Born in Lithuania and reared on the Lower East Side, Volk's finest moments included leveling the 22-story Gillander building on Wall Street in 1910. The Gillander was only 12 years old, marking the first time that such a high-class office building representing the best type of modern fireproof construction had been torn down to make way for a still more elaborate structure. Volk's crew of 250 men worked with tools sometimes hardly changed since Hausmann's day, crowbars and sledgehammers, along with newer pneumatic guns and power winches that hoisted steel beams to idling trucks below. Jordan mentioned salvage, and this was a time when steel and many other materials had considerable salvage value. With most structures largely demolished by hand, Wreckers could carefully remove, clean, and sort items for reu reuse through a sophisticated network of secondhand merchants. Used brick, for example, was valuable due to its high quality compared to imported brick, and many wreckers would pay for the privilege of taking down a structure, making a profit by selling plumbing, steel, marble, timber, even plate glass. As late as the 1950s, for example, a demolition company paid New York City more than $300,000 to take down the Third Avenue elevated rail line, banking on profits from soaring scrap metal prices. At the Gillander building, however, a new dimension of the demolition trade was in effect, the time clause. Due to evolving financial structures, mortgage and interest costs weighed ever more heavily on the builder and prompted speed to become a paramount factor for wreckers. Bonuses for early completion were written into contracts, creating an incentive to develop ever faster demolition methods. Thus fittings at the Gillander, which normally would have been sold for salvage, were landfilled to save time. Another factor shaping the evolving wrecking trade was rising labor costs, which made such time-consuming processes unprofitable. And lastly, the evolution of building materials made salvage more and more impractical. For example, lime mortar was replaced by cement in between bricks, making them much harder to separate and clean so that many a wrecker barged them out to sea and dumped them. As big cities grew, the means of raising them developed in tandem. By 1936, a type of wrecking ball was in use by Jacob Volk's brother, Albert, a tool that became a totemic symbol of the demolition trade. Here's the restaurant tour Toots Shore in 1959, whose Manhattan saloon was favored by sports celebrities merrily posing during the demolition. Toots was paid handsomely to vacate and rebuild his establishment nearby. The use of wrecking balls as well as pneumatic and hydraulic tools complicated the work of reclaiming materials that were now brought down pell-mell instead of one brick or antique doorknob at a time. Interest in salvage would come and go over the coming decades, and the post-war demolition boom that ensued in the 1950s and 60s proved that a kind of salvage economy 
was still alive and well. As Better Homes and Gardens reported in 1961, today's slum buildings now being torn down were yesterday's mansions, the magazine noted, citing leaded and stained glass, marble, and ornamental ironwork that could be had if you scanned the classified section and found advanced news uh, of wrecking jobs whose foremen might cut you a deal. Here, photographs from Danny Lyon's book, The Destruction of Lower Manhattan, shot in 1967, show wreckers salvaging mountains of brick destined to decorate opulent new homes. Salvage was a sideline, however, in a major new act for demolition during the last half of the 20th century. Tectonic shifts in the urban landscape brought slum surgery on the scale of Houseman's Day to the forefront in the United States. Over more than 20 years, the government spent billions to raise 2,500 neighborhoods in a thousand American cities, dispossessing more than a million people in the nation's quest to build safe and sanitary housing. During this time, and in the decades of urban renewal that followed, demolition was considered an agent of catharsis and cleansing, and demolition is sometimes called the dentists of urban decay. One watershed moment was the destruction of Pruitt Igo, the notorious 33 building public housing complex in St. Louis. Initially celebrated as a triumph of sensitive housing design, this 57 acre site and its 10,000 residents became within just 10 years, one of the most disastrous public housing projects ever built. Its failure gave wreckers a redemptive new role, expiation for the government's sins. The tragic fate of the development was traced to decisions by housing officials who had concentrated very poor families onto the site with essentially no support or resources. Rather, um, uh, excuse me, one report noted that architectural design here was neither the culprit nor the cure at Pruitt Igo. Rather, economic crisis and racial discrimination played the largest role in the project's demise. That day, it was said, the implosion became an instant symbol of all that was perceived as wrong with urban renewal, not merely in the United States, but in the world at large. Indeed, Pruitt Igo illustrates the potent role that explosive demolition would play in the coming years. While used on a small number of demolition projects, implosions would attract extraordinary interest in cities facing similar woes not to mention irreverent places like Las Vegas, where the dynamiting of casino hotels highlighted the way that implosions were often about marketing as much as anything else. Much more consequential for the urban landscape was the role demolition began to play in the early 2000s as an antidote to urban abandonment in former industrial powerhouses like Philadelphia and Detroit. As deindustrialization drove urban populations to contract, tens of thousands of vacant buildings were cleared in campaigns premised on public safety. Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to tear down red brick row houses and Victorian mansions that had become a haven for criminal activity, often with the mayor taking a ceremonial first smash at the controls of heavy machinery. These desperate efforts had enthusiastic support from communities that had suffered rampant disinvestment and crime, though others called it urban planning by subtraction. In this view, demolition was deployed as a remedy for a large and complex set of challenges that were only being aggravated by the loss of a neighborhood's physical fabric. Around this time, with skyrocketing disposal costs and ever scarcer opportunities to dump demolition debris in many European nations, for instance, had already banned it from landfills. Wreckers became recycling evangelists. Some called it green demolition. After the year 2000, recycling and salvage contributed as much as 50% of some companies' revenues, and the industry recycled on average 40% of the total materials generated on its jobs. Facing an explosion of interest in more sustainable ways to wreck, trade groups noted that deconstruction, or what was effectively hand demolition, 
was the stage from which the professional demolition industry had evolved decades ago. Now, with hydraulic excavators that could sort materials from the safety of a cab, the modern demolitionist was no longer the urban surgeon or dentist, but rather a kind of investment banker who traded in very expensive machinery. The modern wrecker had come full circle in a way. Like Jacob Volk or Baron Hausmann long ago, he or she was making the most of a most turbulent time. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I think we'll just segue right into that. I think the ending of uh, the comment of investment bankers and in inexpensive uh, machinery is a good segue to Francesca and her research on bulldozers and the history of demolition <laughs> more broadly. I think Jeff hit it on the nail. He, he, could, he could have written every immigrant story I think there were many points that he brought up that reflected very much the fit my understanding of my family. Mm -hmm. We started off and was ripping down like 10 story buildings, which today would be 20, 20 or 25 stories. Very mm -hmm. interesting. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Allison, for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here and uh, to be here with Jordan and Jeff and Juliet. Um, I, I think my, my presentation will fit uh, nicely into a piece of the story that Jeff narrated. Um, I'd like to talk more about the urban renewal history of, um, of demolition. So I'll just share my slides here. All right. Okay. Um, so my comments will draw from uh, my book, Bulldozer, which uh, Allison mentioned already. And I'd like to take you to uh, January afternoon in 1958, when Mayor Dick Lee, uh, Jeff talked about mayors doing the ceremonial uh, destructive action on a building. Uh, this is a mayor who, who did that sort of thing as well. Dick Lee of New Haven, Connecticut, climbed into the operator's cab of a wrecking crane. And with a supportive crowd assembled around him, uh, he swung the crane's skull cracker against the brick walls of an aging tenement building. And in almost no time, the demolition was complete. We only know about this, you know, ephemeral event due to the Life magazine reporting team that was on site that day. One month later, they published a visual record of their visit to New Haven in a three-page photo essay headlined, City Cleanup Champion. And the most striking image in this photo spread depicts Lee, as you see here, seated at the controls of the crane. While the click of the camera's shutter suspends the wrecking ball in midair, the pile of displaced rubble beside it and the largely cleared landscape reflected in the machine's back window testified to both the machines and the mayor's latent power. And Lee, as you can see, can hardly contain his pleasure while unleashing that potential, turning towards onlookers located outside the photographic frame, the beginning of a satisfied smile creeps across his face. Uh, one outtake from the photo shoot shows the wrecking ball even closer to its target and the mayor more focused on his task, but it obscures that facial expression. Another outtake captures his beaming smile but crops the full piece of machinery. And yet a third discarded image depicts the mayor standing triumphant in front of the wreckage after the demolition is through. The chosen represented, representation though, foregrounds both the key human and mechanical players and demonstrates the mayor's personal participation in this work. It also offers a glimpse into the happy emotion that the process produced in him. Among all these options that I showed you, this image that life selected conveys the most celebratory portrait of man and machine triumphing over urban decay. And it was no accident that the journalists were on hand to witness this scene. Lee had orchestrated it specifically for them. His staff proposed the itinerary of the reporters and scheduled the building wrecking as one of their stops. In advance of that visit though, the demolition contractor had cleared out the inside of the building and prepared it so that it would only take a few minutes for the walls to cave in. As a result, according to the agency's, uh, the redevelopment agency's daily demolition report, quote, the building was collapsed in a flourishing manner. Such public spectacles of the seemingly fast and effortless pace of the city's urban renewal demolition campaign were a pretty common practice for the mayor. 
Um, he was even accused of purposely leaving scattered vacant eyesores standing for propaganda purposes and, and none other. Uh, the prevalent site of those decayed abandoned buildings would first bolster the case uh, for the large scale program of destruction that he was advocating. And they'd also assist the mayor in really more practical ways by giving him a steady supply of structures to showcase in public demolition displays. In fact, Lee regularly arranged the demolition of New Haven's most imposing tenement buildings for occasions when dignitaries and journalists joined him on his daily site visits. In this image, he's giving former US presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson a tour. And Lee once made light of this practice, noting, some mayors give out keys to the city. We knock down buildings for our guests. Lee didn't rest once the publication was in print. He orchestrated a letter writing campaign to life and one of those letters to the editor ultimately appeared in print, celebrating the feature as quote, a well-deserved honor for the man who has given this old New England city a decidedly new and hopeful look. Now the celebration and impl implementation of destruction as progress is part of a phenomenon that I talk about um, as a post-war culture of clearance. That is the ideology, technology, policy and practice of large scale destruction. It wasn't just about machines on the ground. There was a larger uh, kind of ethos to it. The culture of clearance underpinned the demolition of buildings and the leveling of land in advance of post-World War II suburban, interstate highway, and urban renewal construction. And the popular embrace of the instruments of this destruction, from the wrecking ball and crane to the bulldozer, is evident not only in photographs uh, like those seen in Life magazine, but also in media ranging from Chamber of Commerce videos uh, to children's books. Books like Buster Bulldozer, which you see on the left, put a happy, friendly face on the instruments of destruction. Um, in the middle, the affable, amiable Bulldozer Man uh, put a similarly friendly face on the operators of those machines. And look how pleased in himself this uh, machine operator looks to have knocked down that building from 1880. And on, on the right, the book Tear Down to Build Up, the story of building wrecking, published just three years after that life photo essay that I showed you further elaborated on the demolition story for young readers. The author of that book writes, of course these cranes are there for the purpose of destruction, the tearing down of buildings, but they're also in many ways a sign of progress of the world moving forward toward better living everywhere. So on the post-war construction sites of both fact and fiction, the narrative of demolition as progress rang out loud and clear. So to put a, a bit more uh, historical context on this, it was the Housing Act of 1949 in the United States that really spurred the urban renewal moment. Uh, under that act, the federal government covered two thirds of the cost of clearing land uh, for new, often private construction. It was that subsidy that required clearance uh, as the initial step that really um, you know, opened the floodgates to the destruction of many American cities. By 1965, nearly 800 municipalities in nearly every state had or planned urban renewal and participation. And New Haven's experience of this national story was typical in process, although somewhat more vigorous in its application. Um, in the city's most active decade of destruction, which was the 1960s, New Haven tore down uh, roughly one out of every six dwelling units. Nationwide, the number was something more like one out of se every 17 dwelling units. So New Haven was ahead of the game. It, it garnered more money per capita than any other city, in fact, uh, for urban renewal. And the urban renewal uh, program that Lee was promoting and which many of his constituents initially supported accounted for most of these losses. Now, accounts of urban renewal often skip from before and after um, as of this view of New Haven in popular uh, ar progressive architecture shows. You might also think of before and after views of slum uh, housing and new construction. What, what I'm interested though in is, is what progress really looked like when it was in progress on the ground. What happens between these two uh, dramatically different scenes? And Lee's performance and life's representation of seemingly quick, clean and easy demol demolition offered a positive perspective on how this work would proceed. As one observer put it, the expectation was that there would be armies of bulldozers tearing down acres of slums. It's really just widespread, quick uh, destruction. The reality though was quite different. There was much more to the post-war work of taking down a building than this, the quick swing of the wrecking ball suggested. Rather the process on many urban renewal projects was slow, dirty, difficult, and environmentally and socially damaging. Uh, for one thing, uh, demolition produced massive amounts of rubble as, as Jeff talked about, uh, which was difficult and costly to dispose of. 
on some of the accounts that I read in New Haven, developers unscrupulously buried materials on site. They had so much trouble getting rid of some of these materials. And you could only uh, learn this later on when there was sinking on some of those properties because they had you know, buried organic material. Um, other pieces of debris littered cleared lots for years as it often took much longer to rebuild than it did to tear down, thereby imposing a different kind of blight on renewal neighborhoods. Although whole blocks were envisioned to come down en masse, think of those armies of bulldozers imagery, difficult relocations and legal opposition led structures to come down in a more patchwork pattern. And you can see that here, that these buildings, that entire block will come down, but it took actually 10 years for every structure uh, to be eliminated. This slowed the process um, and dramatically increased the price of the work as contractors had to switch to smaller, less efficient equipment. It even bankrupted some uh, demolition companies in the process. And further, for those who had to live alongside demolished structures, the pounding of wrecking balls damaged chimneys and party walls and conscribed neighboring citizens to live in, quote, the fear and dust of demolition, as one complainant put it. Um, to dip into, I know, one of the topics that is to, to come in this series of uh, displacement, the lived experience of urban renewal building demolition caused physical, social, and psychological hardships for local residents to say nothing of its impact on, on local businesses. In New Haven, demolition meant relocation for about 30,000 individuals. Uh, the redevelopment agency there offered them modest moving expenses and helped finding new improved housing at comparable costs. Uh, those residents moved to public and private housing within and outside the city, largely improving their physical living conditions. But follow-up studies on other urban renewal projects showed that most displaced residents never regained the sense of community that they had once had. As one relocated New Haven resident later recalled, quote, it was very traumatic for all of us, all of us, a way of life went. And so the burdens of relocation fell disproportionately on the city's minority residents. In New Haven, this often meant Eastern Europeans, Italians, and African Americans. And nationally in the United States, two thirds of residents displaced for renewal were non-white, leading some to rename the program Negro Removal. Now, ultimately, not only the process, but also many of the end products of urban renewal building demolition disappointed. Uh, returning to the laudatory light photo essay that I began my comments with, uh, Mayor Lee suggested promising physical prospects for his redevelopment programs near future, uh, hopeful prospects to use the language of that letter to the editor. A photograph at the bottom of the spread's opening page depicts the mayor standing proudly in front of a white canvas of cleared land. The only thing that the mayor's small figure is really blocking, if anything, is the new building that's going up. Instead, directing the viewer's gaze back toward the empty foreground that dominates the scene. With Lee as our guide, the photograph asks life's readers to appreciate this vista, this blank slate, as part of a new be beginning rather than an end for the city's rapidly changing built environment. But in fact, cleared landscapes such as this one endured for much longer than anyone had anticipated or desired. Uh, residents and business people had experienced relocation as a rushed process, and yet demolition, for all its delays, came, came as a, a sudden blow. But reconstruction in New Haven, as elsewhere throughout the country, could be painfully slow, if it occurred at all. The many ensuing vacant but littered lots created eyesores for the public and insults for those who had only recently called these same areas home. As one former resident recalled, I, was, I always remember with a little bit of bitterness because the neighborhood was structurally, the buildings were sound and it was a nice neighborhood and it certainly was a safe area. And they knocked my house down and they didn't do anything in that neighborhood for 10 years. They just left it a mess. And such delays depleted the city's tax rolls while also impeding repopulation of neighboring sites. One former downtown worker best summed up the city's sorry state of renewal in an impromptu tour he once gave to an out of town visitor. As he later recounted, Okay, so lunchtime, we walked up Crown Street all the way over to Church Street, and lo and behold, there was the new New Haven. And what was it? It was one great big immense parking lot. So these real world experiences of urban renewal created a vastly different picture than those included in the Life Magazine photo essay. As large scale clearance proved neither clean nor quick and produced traumatic physical and social scars alongside some new modernist structures, its initial positive halo began to fade. Lee uh, stopped taking photographs of himself uh, operating a wrecking ball and said was, was pictured at groundbreakings and in front of completed buildings rather than on demolition sites. Popular imagination reflected this shift. 
children's literature, for example, saw the emergence of new kinds of stories about the urban renewal bulldozer. In a dream sequence in the children's book, My House is Your House uh, from 1970, for example, the young protagonist, Juana, is chased by the bulldozer that will soon come to wreck her new New York City apartment building. Such lived nightmare scenarios on real world construction sites galvanized growing opposition in New Haven and across the country. The increasingly vocal critics of urban renewal and related highway clearance work reappropriated the once celebrated machines of destruction and redeployed them as the symbols of their public protest, right? Standing in front of the bulldozer rather than cheering it on. Their efforts led to the cessation or modification of some proposed future projects. And even more significantly, they helped yield legislative reforms in support of rehabilitation, preservation, and increased citizen participation in the planning and use of space. Although building demolition continues today, as it must and as it should, its character and scale have been changed by the processes and consequences revealed during the widespread implementation of this practice on previously welcoming post-war landscapes like New Haven. Thank you. Thank you. That was a, that was a great uh, conclusion to a, a series of presentations that I, I thought flowed very well. Um, the next section of this uh, webinar uh, is intended to be sort of a, a little discussion amongst um, the panelists and, and, um, and myself. Uh, with, um, and I was hoping that uh, we could discuss sort of questions that might have come up for each other, uh, for um, in each other's presentations. There are a lot of really interesting themes um, of sort of these these dynamics between a generative process and a and a and a, a process that was was not and is not. Um, sort of uh, feelings of of pride and and also uh, um, abandonment and and so many others. Um, does anybody want to start it off, Jordan or Jeff? Um, any thoughts that you might have had in 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 these presentations? Well, just uh, thank you um, all for for such such great uh, presentations. Um, you know, we talked a lot about uh, urban renewal, and I'd be interested to to hear Jordan's perspective from you know the demolition uh, standpoint. Um, you know what what that was like for your family or or um, business uh, to go through. I mean, I, it, it's interesting that it was you know, such a traumatic and in a lot of ways experience as Francesca said for communities to live through. Um, but I, I'm sure it was a really complex uh, you know, endeavor um, and a complicated one, you know, if you were um, a, a demolition contractor um, in that uh, environment and at that time in history. Sorry, Jeff. Can you repeat your uh, your question? Sure. I, I just was curious to know what um, you know if if you might have some perspective on on what urban renewal was like for for your family or your business. Um, you know, during that time, um, if you you know you know participated in in some of these big clearance projects um, in Canada or elsewhere. Um, you know, what, what it looked like from your perspective. Um, yeah, so we were we were very involved in some very intelligent uh, reshiftings of some cities. So um, I'm, I know you're not, like, I'm not sure if you and the um, other panelists are familiar with the city of Toronto or have visited or other Canadian cities um, that, uh, that have evolved um, a lot. Um, sort of slower than the United States, but, you know, we played, we played some significant roles uh, in the shapings of, of, of those cities. Um, for, for my time, during my time and my involvement in that side of the business, um, there were a couple of some memorable projects, but they weren't, um, they weren't any sort of city revolutionary kind of deals. Um, my, my, I think the, the largest 
sort of undertakings were by my grandfather um, and when he was involved in the business. And that's where they were aggressive in terms of um, working in New York City, clearing all that urban um, urban dungeon uh, that that formerly was Battery Park. Um, in Toronto, you know, we tore down the six blocks along Young Street uh, for them to build the Eaton Center, which is like a mall of Americas, and um, and then in the in then in a city called Montreal in the province of Quebec, uh, we were instrumental in clearing the way for the Dakiri Expressway, which leads you into the city of Montreal. And so, expressways aren't sexy and, attra and attractive or anything further from urban renewal, but those were some significant projects um, that I do recall. I mean, there were others that uh, um, that were instrumental uh, for um, um, key establishments to get uh, to get completed. Um, and and even within that, but there was also where you brought up, I mean, you you perfectly painted the demolition business. A lot of them were European immigrants that you know, commingled with other European immigrants that were in the scrap business. And so, um, you know, in, in, in Toronto, um, we have, um, you know, one story I could sort of relate to. Um, so my family tore down um, a single block, maybe three times in the city. So my, my great grandfather, did it then my grandfather went and did it and then my dad did it the same corner and so um you know there's there's urban renewal at, at, at its best and you know um let, let's say two european jewish descent families working together um and uh and and uh and and getting and 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 then you know one would finance the scrap metal the other one would take it apart and they were the labor component and you know as those sort of partnerships forged um they would get bigger and so like just interesting enough to the two panelists who are american on this on this on this panel there's an association called the national it's called the national demolition association it's the nad it's the nada and the NADA used to be called the National Association of Demolition Contractors, the NADC. And it was formed by many famous wrecking companies um, that were out of the state. So like you mentioned the Hudson implosion that was done by Palm Ridge out of uh, Michigan. And, you know, um, there was the Cleveland Wrecking Company, which was a mammoth operation in the United States. Um, there was, um, um there was uh in the united states there was schwall uh cherry dh griffin a lot of these companies have either sold or, or have commingled. but these guys all came together to form this association and you know the during the 60s and 70s and 50s when the urban renewal was the these 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 gentlemen that were you know a, a very very different uh backgrounds and where they came from and mannerisms and 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 they came together to talk about salvage and strategy and uh so we were able to employ a lot of those technologies into the urban renewal project sorry i got a little carried away but i figured i would explain that no absolutely thank you so i have a question that um jordan or jeff one either of you might have thoughts on thinking about kind of the demolition industry, you know, the, the wrecking companies that I looked at in New Haven, they're often very small, local, kind of new endeavors, uh, not, not older ones like, like yours, Jordan. Um, and, I, you know, I got the sense that they were, they were bidding low and they were trying to get in on this and, uh, and that the city was motivated to choose them in part because these were public projects and they, they, they needed to choose the low bidder. And that's why they had a lot of problems. Companies like Cleveland Wrecking would bid and they'd bid higher and they wouldn't be selected. Um, and so these these you know firms would go away. So I was just curious about kind of the industry, um, you know, what came out of, of urban renewal that, that you know, and and like what, how did certain companies manage to survive and some didn't? And was it this kind of smarts about how to do the work, how to price the work, but being more selective? Because it seemed like the urban renewal moment offered this 
bonanza of, of, of opportunities that allowed for many new businesses to enter, but maybe not survive. So, you know, how did the industry um, and maybe the, the the organization you talked about, Jordan, these national organizations, is a response to that too. Um, but how did the industry kind of shift overall um, as a result of maybe a verbal renewal in that moment? So like there were very few Canadians in that National Association of Demolition Contractors. I think there was like three and maybe four, and we were all from the same different province. Um, let me let me let me explain to you a couple of things. One, the, the demolition business is like when you run it like a multifaceted corporation, which is what we aim to do, um, and these things become like living, breathing organizations, they're very capital intensive. And one miss on any job could bankrupt your business. Like you could, you could do, take one big massive job and you could bank on scrap value and the scrap market to could totally tank and you would be um, holding inventory in, that you've already booked or potentially sold. So that's like one issue to the families. So, you know, like there's a lot of, there are some families that are kicking around from the original, uh, the original rap pack that was part of the demolition of the 50s, 60s, 70s. I remember like the story about my grandparents going down to the National Association of Demolition Contractors convention in Vegas. And one of the guys there was Italian. And, you know, there used to be an airline called Eastern Airlines out of the United States. And, you know, they, they missed their flight back to Toronto and Louis knew somebody at Eastern and they flew back in an Airbus A330 by themselves with a stewardess and a pilot. So these were the, these were the, you know, the wrecking companies of the, of yesterday were very um, mob infiltrated for, first of all, because of the unions and, and what was involved. And if you were doing business in the United States or in Canada, uh, you, and you were a big player, you were in the unions, the unions, um, the wages, uh, in terms like, let me, let me organize how I'm going to answer this question. So one, the business is very capital intensive. Two, you know, you you bring up uh, the guys that are bidding the municipal and state or provincial or, or federal uh, contracts. And, you know, um, so federal contracts, if you're going to go and tear down a, uh, a Quonsite hut or you're going to tear down a little admin building, they're not so fussed about it. But if they are tearing down, let's say, a nuclear or some sort of aero, aero facility like an airport or somewhere in NASA, those are usually guys that are pre-qualified and have very large bonding capacities and safety and, and they're just monstrosity of corporations. Um, every business has a life cycle. And so, you know, um, in the wrecking business, I, I, I see um, some family dynamics in that, in that business where maybe, you know, the father ran the business a certain way and the kids could not run to what the, to a part of what the, the father was running it at, at. And you see a lot of these business sales, you know, there's a couple of guys that I know down in the United States that I remember as a kid, we would go down to the conventions and we would sit with these people. And, you know, if you Google them now, um, they, they've sold the business to our employees. Um, one of them, uh, that I was looking at the other day um, was Asperitas. And Asperitas was, was, is a big wrecker out of the United States. Uh, and he, uh, he has kids. Uh, one of his kids is on the, on the, um, the soap opera, Days of Our Lives. And, uh, and, and the, kids, the kids aren't in the business. He sold the business to someone that was in his, his next of kin. So, you know, um, why these businesses don't last is sometimes they get merged into these Multi corporations in Canada, um, a few of the wreckers uh, or demo contractors um, had been uh, acquired by, let's say, income funds that were building environmental portfolios, or or someone that went and built a multifaceted corporation that was doing demolition, soil remediation, toxic waste remediation, scrap metal, garbage distribution, and waste transfer. You know, uh, we ran our business like that and had separate divisions for garbage waste transfer, scrap metals, and demolition. I mean, most of the larger outfits are set up like that. And so we tended to follow suit of the American model in Canada, employing a lot of the American technologies. So, you know, the very capital intensive business, the, the attachments, the equipment, uh, the, the, the money that you need 
to take down uh, buildings today is a lot different than um, than yesterday. That's yesteryear. Um, you know, a ten-story building is a big deal uh, back when that Lithuanian uh, immigrant tore down that building. Um, you know, that was a big job for him. Today, you go in there with your high reach and and some swing platforms, and you're banging that thing out quicker than you would know. And you also, you know, back then you had a lot of labor. Today they put the jacks and the hoists and the they they shore up the building. They throw little bobcats on and you put the hammers on. And you know, I remember um, seeing pictures and I have them and I have them put away of my grandfather. Um, he 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 knew a wrecker from France. And what he did is he took a crawler crane. He took the crawler off. He put steel beams underneath. And he lowered it on a building and they used it to smash the floors with a little wrecking ball and a little pear shaped uh, ball. And they would just hit the floor and hit the floor and hit the floor and it would break the floors down. And so, you know, it was this sort of collective collusion that, or, or sharing of information that, that obviously made these family companies uh, more sophisticated. But I think a lot of them would dismantle um, uh as the um, families, um, maybe the maybe the kids kids couldn't run the business. Uh, it's probably one of the reasons why the kids are in, in there. And two, um, when you make a comment, well, I see at the town there's newer demolition companies, and those guys that are starting those demolition companies came from the Cle probably the Cleveland wreckings of the world, where they had that training and sophistication, and uh, and. Uh, and were able to um, to do to to do what they what they wanted to do. Um, you also got to think about too um, the next generation. So me being fifth, my parents didn't want me in the wrecking business. They said go. I, I went and I actually became a lawyer. I'm a I'm a lawyer and and licensed in Toronto, Ontario. Um, you know, play different roles, but uh, you know uh, th that was the way to go. Um, I think there was some cultural. Um, issues and potentially also a little bit of racism, racism that led into people going into the demolition business, like Jewish immigrants that couldn't find jobs and they were picking up scraps and those scraps then became their ability to to go and buy that building, take it apart, sell the door, sell the sell the steel, sell the shingles, sell the sell the nails, and then eventually, you know, from that, it would evolve into a, a very sophisticated operation. And I can't say for our family that was one of the cases, but I, I do know for from another competitor family that uh, lasted to its uh, third gen uh, fourth generation that that was the case that uh, how they started. So there was some so there was some socioeconomics. I find that so interesting that the conversation and the question about renewal sort of um, the story and the answer comes and and also and and the question the other question about sort of competition and and how how um, companies survive through generations both answers come back in some ways to this notion of family and this notion of sort of an a, multi-generational inheritance um, and this sense of, I mean, I'm just connecting it to um, a, an idea of sort of this, this dream and this idea of progress of, of your children um, coming out better than you did and, and, and progress in that way um, and accumulation of wealth in, in a family. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, a, um, there's something else happening there. And, and to think also about the way that the, there's a story of um, tech, technological innovation, the sort of uh, transition through time and that everyone has sort of, um, that story that everyone has shared there, um, moving from increasingly more complex tools. Um, I wonder, yeah, I, I found Francesca the, the story about, or the question about um, the portrayal of happiness and, and speed and 
uh, progress and then the reality of um, the feeling of, of being amidst it, um, how dirt, just the, the dirt of it and the, and also, um, you know, I'm just imagining going into sites and having to wreck them when the, um, the previous inhabitants and community were not, uh, like, were not willing to, <laughs> or not happy to see that happen. Just the general sentiment really shifting. Um, and, and the story that you tell is really about sort of the way that this idea of the bulldozer and the idea of wrecking in general sort of permeated culture and tried to sort of force, or I don't know, would you say force um, to promote it, let's say, uh, promote that, that idea. And that's such a huge part of our, our, our notion of, of cities in progress, even to this day. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. Um, and you know, I've I've gone on since this research to look at places that tried to preserve more buildings. And one um, I'm studying uh, Philadelphia in particular right now through its renewal work. And and one of the reasons for doing that, um, you know, there's lots of, of reasons for trying to save more buildings. Um, and the historical aspect of Philadelphia prompted some people to try to save some of the older buildings. But you know, one of the motivating factors was the um, that it was cheaper in some cases to do rehabilitation than to, to demolish. And so there, there are you know, different things that people learned along the way. And uh, as legislation changed to incentivize and allow different behaviors, that has a big impact. So I mentioned the Housing Act of 49 um, was predicated on clearance. Um, in the United States, the Housing Act of 1954, another urban renewal act, um, allowed you to spend your, your government grants on rehabilitation. Uh, and so I think policies pay, play a big part in stimulating one behavior or another. And um, we have a question, I guess it's in the private chat from Susan Ross asking about, you know, how uh, that a lot of the material um, that gets salvaged is recycled today, and how would we ever, you know, catch up with, um, you know, having things uh, deconstruction and things be saved? And and you know, my thought about that is that policy would be the thing that would do that. We'd need to institute some uh, incentives, economic incentives, uh, policy requirements. That's how behavior shifts a lot of the times too. As Jeff points out, this is you know, this practice has a long history, and it's always going to to be here. And, that makes sense. Uh, but if for material shifts and the amount of demolition that happens and whether every city is going to turn to that in the way that, you know, American cities in, it did in the 50s and 60s due to urban renewal, that's because of policy that really made this economically viable, um, that the courts were talk, allowing eminent domain so that more properties could be taken for this too. So I, I really think that, you know, local, uh, you know, provincial and, and, and federal policies are the things that could start to spur this in a different direction. Otherwise, I don't know on its own organically if that could happen. I don't know if others um, have thoughts on that one. Well, for, well, you know what, Francesca, there's there's certain mayors that 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 have had this sort of demolition bug in them where they've unleashed a uh, demolition. So you know, um, from an American perspective, um, New York has had its fair share of 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 of. Of, of destruction. Um, Chicago, no. For some reason, it's been the architectural gem that they've protected. And so, you know, they've been able to incorporate. Um, Toronto um, had a mayor by the name of Nathan Phillips, and he ordered the entire city of Toronto, including the downtown core, to be demolished. Um, in, in Montreal, they had... Um, um, the, may the mayor that, uh, he was the famous mayor that Expo 67 uh, was there, Depew, I think was his name. And he was, uh, he, he also was uh, one that influenced um, demolition practices. Um, we in Toronto play in the condo development world on the other side of our fence. Uh, we, we, we buy urban sites and develop and some of them have heritage significance. And there's one project in particular in, a pro in an area called Deer Park, which is um, sort of like uh, Greenwich in New York City. And there's a heritage house that's there. And everyone thinks that because Tepperman is involved in the development company being made, that I'm gonna go in there and raise this thing. And the counselor's nervous and he's causing a lot of noise. And he says that it's in your culture. 
and your behavior and your mannerism to go and wreck that thing. <laughs> and I think it's very much who's involved in the process that involve that lets the demolition happen in the city. And I've been involved in a number of projects that have been built in the 70s and projects that have been built in the 1800s. And there's been a difference of opinion of what de des designates and constitutes heritage and where demolition is not warranted. And so it's a political process, very much so as a business, as a city urban renewal, and as well as something that it creates better and more healthier cities that we continue to live in. And so people have to be alert that demolition is very much a political process. And it's a very political process for three reasons. One, because of the building and nature of what's being dismantled or recreated from the destruction that's to happen. Two, the mannerism in the demolition. And what kind of, pro, um, there were times in the United States and in Canada, you could not swing the wrecking ball in the cities. They would not let you. So wreckers had to get innovative on how to deal with that. And that was political. And the third political uh, process is how much demolition is going to be allowed. There are districts in Toronto and greater United States cities that you can't even renovate the toilet in the building because of heritage preservation. And so they don't, they don't, they don't care that you could, you could be sitting in the toilet and your foot's gonna go through the, the ceiling. As long as that thing is preserved, that's all they care about. And that, so very much so, the demolition itself as a concept is very much influenced politically. Thanks, thanks, Jordan. Um, I, I we're at that stage where we're gonna at, we're going to uh, Francesco already picked up on some questions from the chat, but we're gonna segue into that um, segment now. Um, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Juliet because she's been trolling that zone. Great. Uh, thanks so much to all the speakers and to Allison for moderating so far. Um, just on the notion of kind of the, the politics and thinking about the results of the city of Paris, this question is from Virginia Barton and it's for you, Jeff. Um, do you think that we should reconsider our position on demol demolition and specifically with regards to the results from the city of Paris? Oh, that's a good question. I think there are, there are many, many ways to, to look at it. Um, and I think scholarly and um, uh, sort of, um, you know, it's sort of opinion is divided on, on the question. You know, many people um, still consider the, the urban fabric that was destroyed during Husband's Day to be, to have been really special and, and irreplaceable and, and sort of what he did was, was a crime. It was a kind of assassination of, of the city. Um, but then others, you know, would, would say that, you know, the, the new Paris that was built um, through this process of demolition and clearance and renewal um, is, you know, today what we know of as the great city of Paris with its kind of trademark features and, um, and, and physiognomy. Um, so I think there are just, you know, there, there are different ways to look at it. I mean, personally, um, I can see both sides of the question. Um, you know, those, those photographs of, uh, of, of Charles Marvies, of these um, incredibly beautiful winding narrow lanes, um, you know, many of them still exist in the city and they're, they're, they're just um, so uh, characteristic of, 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 of the place that, you know, it's, it's hard to think of how many of those places were, were demolished um, to create these new boulevards. Um, so it's, um, you know, a lot of different perspectives on it. Um, so sort of, thank you, thank you, Jeff. Uh, sort of related to that, uh, we have a question here from Eric who is wondering whether the panelists could comment on the fact that constant demolition, uh, maybe even on the same site, is a symptom of bad or unimaginative design. 
And would well-designed adaptable buildings and neighborhoods not be better for urban renewal than wholesale removal? Um, and we can think about uh, New York City's Soho in the 60s or Toronto's distillery district. These areas uh, are far more valuable for having not been demolished. You know, uh, let me comment on that because I started that conversation with the corner. So uh, number one, no, that wasn't, that, that wasn't the reason why that corner got demolished four times. <laughs> Um, the original Eaton's building was a yep, the original Eaton's building was at Young and Queen, and that building was like four stories. And then they tore then my so my grandfather, great grandfather tore those buildings down to build the Eaton's warehouses, which spanned like six blocks. And the and so the department stores, whether it was Macy's, Bloomingdale's, JC Penney, all these department stores once dominated very valuable real estate. And so, no, it wasn't part of bad architecture. It was it, it contributed to the issue of um, of um, of urban renewal, of building better and and stronger centers that invited more forms of community and city renewal. And so, it's not necessarily like the fact that Tepperman went to that corner four times doesn't necessarily mean that it was it was bad. It meant that it was just getting better. And as things evolve over centuries, um, technologies are better. Like in New York and most metropolitan centers, like they are building 80 to 90 story condo towers. So in 1920 or 1900, whenever they built that Eaton's building, I don't think they were thinking past six stories because they themselves did not understand of how a building would get to that size right so that's that i mean that that's my answer to it i'll let the other panelists comment i'll just add that you know a lot has to do with location right um and so corner properties in particular when when i look at you know, um, philadelphia where they did clearance and um and also preservation, the corner properties almost always were demolished because those were the really valuable locations for commercial commercial use or whatever the case may be. Um, and and so it's about uh, location as, as much as anything too, and what the zoning code will allow to be done, right? So if a if a corner is is zoned to allow a bigger building envelope, and that's not, you know, to Jordan's point that it's there's a smaller structure there, then there's the economic imperative. I'm not sure that any architecture could save it. Um, although um, you know historical protections could save it, but um, but it, a lot of it comes down to to zoning um, and 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 then what that makes um, palatable from a real estate perspective. So it, it's not surprising to me that certain sites would continue to be upgraded if if the zoning um, would support that and and if it was a desirable location, as obviously uh, this one sounds like it was. Being a developer as well. And, and building out those 20, 30, 40 story towers, I would tend to agree with Francesca. Um, we have wrecked buildings that we actually have bought in, that were built like eight, nine years ago and just better reposition the properties for many, very many reasons. And so um, um, it's all, as Francesca was saying, it's, it's, it's also about location and about changing zoning and urban patterns that facilitate the need for the demolition to come in and do what they have to do, to do whatever has to be done to renew that, that parcel. Great, thank you both for, for those answers. Um, Philippe here is asking a question about the, the proportion of demolition waste that is recycled today. And I, I wanna couple this with a question from Susan Ross, um, and this is addressed to, to all the panelists. So A, what proportion of demolition waste is recycled? I guess if, if you know from the US perspective or the Canadian perspective. Um, and then given that the, the vast majority of materials that are salvaged are recycled and not stocked in yards for reuse, um, and all of the historical perspectives that you've all presented on demolition, uh, what is the kind of likelihood or, or chance that more careful, skilled wrecking or deconstruction or reuse could ever catch up in a meaningful way to present forms of demolition? Uh, what would have to change? Um, so today, here's, here's 
like it, demolition has always been a recycling process. Most of the major demolition companies will have salvage yards. So we had salvage yards across the country. And so we would sell the two by fours, the joices, the, the copper pipes, the, 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 the reclaimed fence, the equipment, tanks, you name it, we were selling it. Um, fire escapes were very popular, uh, doors. Um, but today you can go to Home Depot and buy the same crap for half the price by the time we take it out and salvage it. It's a big problem. And so that's that's number one that's that killed the business. And most of the demolition companies um, in the United States and Canada, um, they have salvage yards, um, but they're not what they used to be. In the 70s and 80s, uh, those, those salvage yards were very quite profitable. Um, so that's number one. Number two, everyone, we do like there is strive for demolition efficiencies and 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 recycling. Like you don't just go in and demolish a building. You would gut like in a, in a typical office building setting. You would gut the building of drywall right back to the concrete so that the concrete is crushed and and maybe reused for um, for harbor projects or fill projects or or to for for crush three quarter crush three quarter crush inch stone that they usually throw on the highways. So that that's kind of that's kind of where the, the salvage is. Then you know there's there's recycling processes for the glass and 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 met and flooring and roofing and uh and um um uh other resources we we used to take the roofing off of the buildings through and then throw it through a tub grinder and and then make asphalt out of it and then we would re-asphalt parking lots that weren't going to be rebuilt so it, it's it's still very much a, a recycle a very intensive recycling uh it's just not the business is just not uh it's just not to the recycling of 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 what was going on uh, 50 years ago is not the recycling that's going on today. I think I'm gonna jump in. Uh, we have about three minutes left in the program uh, before uh, the, that ends. There are so many more questions in the chat. We'll find a way to post those and or um, make use of them in, in generating uh, more from this conversation. Um, I think it's ending on a, on a really interesting note and something that will provide an important segue um, to the next theme on deconstruction, um, which sort of bookended the story of demolition in some ways, um, in that the, the idea of wrecking as this process that is akin to, to demolition, but um, it is uh, originates or sort of characteristically different in that it um, it retains the the use of, of a lot of the architectural materials and with the hopes of integrating them in, in new projects or other projects. Um, and that's sort of the premise of, of what seems to be a, a growing conversation and idea and in fact movement in, in much of the United States and other parts of, of the world and indeed in Canada. And uh, we're excited to explore that theme. Um, it's really important that we understand this history of demolition, though. Um, it's this story and the multiple stories that the evolution of, of, of the technology and the process, but also the sort of cultural attitudes, notions of waste and how that shifted the process itself. Um, it's really, really important. Um, and thank you all so much for, for sharing your research and experience with us. Allison. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So 929, we'll, um, we'll cut it off here. Thanks again. And uh, thank you for everyone who's attending. Thank you, Juliet, for moderating the questions. Have a good night. Bye, everyone.